<laughs> you all set, Drum? I'm all set. Beautiful. Well, good morning, everybody. We're starting the uh, first uh, session of uh, the focus group for 2023. And it's a pleasure to in introduce our speaker today, Jerome Legions. Uh, we met in a very unusual way in that uh, two years ago, uh, we both independently signed up with uh, WCBE, uh, the Virginia Public Media, to, to meet someone of uh, opposite uh, backgrounds. And uh, he signed up and we were put together. Um, all I knew was his name was Jerome and his, he was president of a large civic association. Um, I, I cheated a little bit and I googled him and found out a lot about him beforehand. And one of the things I found out was about the Miller School, the Miller Street School. And that intrigued me since I've been in academia my life, during my lifetime. And uh, so I popped his picture. And so I had a little bit of an advantage over Jerome when we first met. We had a moderator and uh, uh, it was recorded, and go, it's going to the Library of Congress and talks. But anyway, um, the, the moderator asked me, what do you want to t talk to uh, Jerome about? Oh, well, I think they wanted us to talk about racial issues. Well, we've talked about racial issues, but over the past two years. But I said, I want to talk about the Miller School. And well, that got him going. And so we had a grand conversation for about an hour, and then we've had two conversations with WCBE since then, all recorded. But Jerome uh, is an interesting gentleman. He's a civic leader, activist, and president of the Carver District. If you, you don't know the Carver District, it's uh, just west of Jackson Ward, just west of MCV, uh, and east of the Siegel Center uh, there on Broad Street. Um, uh, his talk today is going to be on, on the restoration of the 1885 uh, uh, Moore School. Uh, he hails from Philadelphia, but uh, came to Richmond a few years ago, a few years ago, just a few years ago, uh, to go to Virginia Union, and he stayed on. Um, he has a, uh, a lawnmower service that he's president of. He also teaches at Keto, which is a uh, one of the martial arts. Uh, he's a uh, president of his civic association at the Carver District. He is a, a, a busy man. He's also president of the Miller, uh, Miller Street School Foundation. And so, without further ado, uh, a warm welcome to Cedarfield for Jerome Legends. Jerome? Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Wait, use the microphone, oh, please. Okay. <laughs> Let me get out of your way. It's portable, so you can get it. No, no. It's not. No. How about now? Oh, yeah. Is that much better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome, and also, too, thank you for the opportunity to talk about Moore Street School. Uh, I really love that process about talking about the building. There's several things that's going on, so we'll talk about that and see if I can't get you excited as I am and to get you engaged as far as Moore Street School is concerned. As far as Moore Street School, this is the building as it stands. It's located in the Carver community, and it's right behind Carver Elementary School. The wonderful thing about Moore Street School, it was built in 1886, and it was the first school built after Reconstruction for African Americans. It was built by this guy right here. This is Lieutenant Colonel W.E. Cutshaw, who was a VMI graduate, and I was told that I need to mention that. But he was also he was also the actually the engineer for the city of Richmond, and he had heard the city of Richmond for the most part to redesign and re, uh, revitalize the city of Richmond pretty much while it was still in its uh, a devastated state after the Civil War. You probably know Colonel Cutshaw's work if you have been around Richmond. You have seen Old City Hall. This is designed by Colonel Cutshaw. 
of the Carolinas Colonel Cutshaw, the but Pump House that's located off of Pump House Road is Colonel Cutshaw, where Canal of Trace is located. Then you have uh, Arthur Ashe Boulevard, which is Colonel Cutshaw's work once again. You have Bird Park, you have Libby Hill, you have um, Monroe Park, which is all designed by Colonel Cutshaw. All right, and then you have the Black History Museum, which is Colonel Cutshaw's work as well. And then you have Moore Street School, which is near and dear to my heart for the most part, because for the mere fact it's in my neighborhood and has been sitting around vacant for quite some time. And so I can't read my writing, uh, not from here anyway. The value of Moore Street School to the Carver community, bear with me for a moment, to the Carver community is a middle-class working neighborhood what I want to talk about as far as that's concerned, for the longest time, Carver community was considered a black neighborhood. And I start changing the narrative as far as that's concerned because what I realized is that what we were talking about by calling it just an African American community was the fact that we negated other um, folks who had lived in the city, or who lived in the neighborhood. So I now tell people that the Carver community is a middle class working neighborhood with a strong African American experience. The African American experience, as far as Carver is concerned, is actually on its sunset, which is why it's very important to show that we save the landmarks that actually allowed us to have an experience and nurture us to become, you know, the citizens, the productive citizens, as far as the city of Richmond is concerned, the state of Virginia, as well as the country, if not internationally. All right, so as far as that is concerned, this is the problems and the challenges of saving landmarks that's actually near and dear to the African American community. For the most part, they got unnoticed or they become, they, or they disappear. If you look at things like Evergreen Cemetery or the uh, sacred burial grounds for the most part and the fight that went on to recover that and to reclaim that, these are the kinds of things that we kind of have to say. And it's not only just one segment of the community, it's not one segment of the city, but it's all of the city that's for the most part. Let me go back to Colonel Cutshaw for a minute. What I think about Colonel Cutshaw as far as being a Confederate soldier that designed a building as such a, as such a magnificent piece of architect for African Americans, I had to ask myself what was on his mind to create something fantastic that he did that had a that was that is pretty much withstanding the test of time. We are in the process of, do, of do, doing research on the Moore Street School. All right, let me just continue on. Okay, so the challenge about Moore Street School is that it has had pretty uh, several starts and stops, all right? People would say, this is a great building and we need to do something with it. And so people wanted to kind of figure out what they were gonna do. As far as the Civic Association was concerned, we toured this building over and over. And I think I've been in car for maybe about 20 years. And within that 20 years, through four city council representatives, I've been in that building four times, and not including the last time as the Civic Association president or as the president of the Moore Street School Foundation. And so with that being said, what happened as far as Moore Street School was concerned, I said, enough is enough. It's time for these start and these stops. We have really got to make something happen. We've got to turn this building back into a landmark for two reasons. One, for the architectural detail of the building, because once, if this building is gone, it's gone. We lose some of the character of the city of Richmond as to what the city used to look like, number one. Number two, we would lose the historic value of this building as well. All too often we think about the Rosenwald schools where the series of robot buildings that were designed for African Americans throughout the, well, throughout the country for the most part, but we're reclaiming the Rosenwald schools and this school in and of itself has the same sort of importance as the Rosenwald school does for us as a community, us as a city, us as a nation for the most part. And so that's why the Moore Street School Foundation came into play, into being. All right, once again, let me take you on a brief tour of the Moore Street School and what it looks like. Outside, when you look at it from afar, it is, it's just a great looking building. But when you walk into the doors, you sort of see these kinds of conditions for the most part. Um, they're pretty bleak, but they're still pretty strong and solid, all right? You see decaying walls for the most part. You see some of the windows that are missing because of vandalism, you know, lack of care. I love the clock in that building because the clock is as though time has, well, it's, it's like time has stood still because the clock is not working, but, you know, that's probably the last time that clock worked. That 
built that. Oh, I can do this. Right here, this is one of my favorite rooms or favorite pictures as far as the building is concerned. I had an opportunity to go in there with the architect that had, this is a phenomenal for me as the member of the Morse Street School Foundation. The architect that worked on the building in 2005 to help bring it back is now on the board and he's working on the building again. So we toured the building with him and he took this picture and he said, let me, he said he forgot how well the sun shines in this building. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, I would have never taken a picture like that, you know? That picture in itself with the sun shining through, it's symbolic for me because it feels as though there's rays of hope. I know that's a little cheesy, but bear with me. <laughs> the, uh, the reason why I say, ah, ha, ah, my discoveries, when we walked into the building, it was so, Phenomenal for me to see artwork that the kids have produced. That artwork is still on the bulletin boards, on the walls throughout the, throughout the building. And so once we acquire the building, the goal is to take that artwork and to preserve it. And so it will go into our archives as to say, this is a reminder of what was and who used the building for the most part. I'm really excited about the opportunity of gathering that artwork up and putting it and, re and preserving it. Okay, so after we had toured Morris Street School, there was Plan A, and Plan A was designed to say, let's find something to do with the building. You can see this is a 2005, well maybe it's not up there, but this was a 2005 plan of action for Morris Street School. This is a uh, plan from, this was the floor plan from the 2005 this, um, architectural detail and so we took those six, there's 16 classrooms in the building and so we took some of those classrooms and made them flex spaces well needless to say plan a died nothing happened then we were really excited about plan b and plan b was vcu was going to come in and take the building and make it a uh, early childhood development center and so this was a long time that the Navy Hill was being produced, if you will. And so everybody was excited about the development of Moore Street School, the development of Navy Hill, as well as some other developments. Well, Navy Hill fell through and so did Carver. I mean, not Carver, but so did Moore Street School. And so there you see the, from Commonwealth Times, VCU student newspaper, where it talks about the early childhood development efforts of Moore Street School, and then you see from the Richmond Free Press how VCU said we're not going to do this any longer. And the reason why is because the school board, once again, was just taking too long to do what they needed to do to get it in the hands of Virginia Commonwealth University. And so here I am, all right? And I like to say, as a visionary, a dreamer, uh, a fool, I sort of rushed in and said, let's get together and do a foundation. Let me introduce you to some of the members of the foundation, okay? And we call that Plan C, all right? This is not a member of the foundation, but he actually helped to lay the foundation for Morris Street School. As Warren had told you, we talked about everything but racial disparities, okay? We talked about what unites us for the most part. And so we kept talking, we kept talking, we kept talking, and we talked about so many things, and I had talked about Moore Street School incessantly until I was surprised that he didn't say shut up. Okay, <laughs> well anyway, not only did he help me through some of the processes, Warren was the first donor for the project. And because he donated, I felt as though we were on the right path, the right move, because he believed in the project sight unseen. He only heard me talk about it. He had no idea what the building looked like. He has never been inside of the building. He just allowed me to ramble on and on and on and on and on, and he said, here's a check. Okay? And so I was happy to go back to our board members and say, guess what, folks? We're on the right track. Someone believes in the project. Someone is thinking that we are going to make this happen. And so we're moving along greatly. These are some of the members of the board, and let me introduce you to them. The guy with the shirt on without the tie, that's Nick Cooper. Nick Cooper worked on the Moore Street School Foundation Plan A as a, I guess maybe fresh out of architectural school. 
And he was the one that came back and said, and when I asked him to work on the board, he said, fine, I absolutely love this project. And so he came back and said he forgot how exciting this building was, how high the ceilings are. And so he just been just fabulous and amazing as far as that's concerned. The next gentleman to Bill, I mean, to um, Nick Cooper is Bill Johnson. And I was pretty strategic as far as picking people to be on the board. Bill Johnson is, he was the city council representative for the third district. So he knows how the city works, okay? And that was a few years ago. Then there's Kim Gray, who was recently a member of the second district. Moore Street School is, was in her district at the time when she was city council. And so she was the one that was responsible for introducing VCU to the building to say that, they, that this would be a, a perfect place to use it as an early childhood development center. Um, that's Penny Fletcher with the arms folded, and Penny Fletcher was with the Branch Museum, which is located on Monument and Davis. And she is the, or she was the exec director, and she is the grant, she was the grant writer. Well, Penny is the grant writer for us. And so we are way ahead of the game because Penny is just an amazing grant writer. She's always thinking about the next move as far as getting money from anyone and everyone. Next is um, Nell, and Nell is the vice president at Strayer University, and so she is strategic as far as planning is concerned. So she's the one that says you have to do step A before you even think about doing step Z, all right? And before you do step Z, you better have A sub, so forth and so forth. So she pretty much keeps us on track. The next person is Robbie Rohr. Robbie is a person that just said, this sounds exciting, clue me in, I'm retired, I need something else to do. But she has worked with the Outdoor Foundation, and so she understands what we're looking at as far as this project is concerned. And so she is also a person that loves to use her hands and build things. We would tease Robbie because she said, I'm going to build a shed. Well, we didn't realize that she was building a two-story shed. Sally Brown is also, was also a member of the um, Branch Museum. And Sally Brown was an interior designer, and so she came along with the project because she likes the idea of helping to program and, re and re re redesign the space. And then you have Bill Harrison, okay? And Bill Harrison is, he was with Diversity Thrift or Diversity Richmond, and he moved Diversity from a thrift store to something that's pr a pretty large entity in the, not only the LGBTQ community, but the city of Richmond at large. He said that it, under his tutelage, as far as being the exec director, what he wanted to do was to make it the diversity inclusive so that it's not looking as something, so it's not something that is just set aside for the most part. Steven Spracker is our newest board member, which is why we don't have a picture of, of him, up there, up there of him. But Steven is with the, uh, he is a vice president of Raymond James. And he said, I'll give you one year and I'll help you find money as far as this project is concerned. So I was really excited about Steven joining the board. And Robbie actually brought Steven along to the group. That's me once again. And then beside me is John Mitchell. John Mitchell's family used to produce the Daily Planet newspaper here in Richmond. John Mitchell is currently the exec director of Evergreen Cemetery, which you may have heard about in the news. And he's also the director of, I can't think of the second cemetery, but he's actually working on two cemeteries. And we're doing a quid pro quo because he's on my board and I'm joining his board to help out get the cemetery up and running. If you've ever seen copies or pictures of that cemetery, it's a pretty bad state of affairs. All right, this is Plan C, and Plan C is pretty exciting, all right? This is with Hanbury Architectural Design Firm. And so we talked to Nick, and I asked Nick, I said, what do you think about this project? And he said, give me the paperwork and give me an idea and give me some time. So this is them actually planning. And if you can kind of see or look on the desk, you can see that they're taking some sketches to say this is what we can conceivably look at doing as far as Moore Street School is concerned. Once again, with Plan C, so Plan C has begun. And this, these books that you see, these books are still inside of the building. Now, I know I can't see that, but anyway, um, Hanbury, who you see names in the corner there, I'm not 
oh, right there, okay? Not only did they say what's the next steps, but then they kind of said what we need to look at is the infrastructure, uh, update our building codes, make sure that they're in, a, in alignment in the, as far as using the building, modernize the building systems, address technical challenges uh, and deterioration in the building, enhance safety and security, celebrate the historic character of the building. And that's really important to us because uh, I didn't mean to do that. I've been going the wrong way. Bear with me for a second. Uh, can you see the end of the, bear with me. Okay, I'm back, all right. The spatial experience, as far as the spatial experience is concerned, what we were looking at as far as the building was concerned, there's a set of steps, and we had some people that we wanted to take on tour, but they couldn't get in the building because of the way the steps were designed. And so the architects that's working with us as far as the project is concerned, they're actually doing a different rendition or a different entry as far as the building is concerned. So therefore, when you get to the building, it's more of a wow factor than looking as though it's an obstacle. Uh, student life. What we're looking for as far as the building is concerned, how do we make this a community engaged project? And as far as the community engaged project, what, what the goal is, is to turn the Moore Street School into a performing arts training center. And so with it being a performing arts training center, what we want to do is focus on jazz, which is not getting the kind of recognition, the support that other um, sort of community engaged programs are receiving and we want to also look at gospel as well and so we'll have things like a gospel training program so therefore you can do things like you can go in there and just learn how to sing or you can go in there and be part of an ensemble it's the same thing with jazz you can go in there and learn how to play an instrument or you can become part of an, an ensemble what we're looking at as far as the space is concerned also too is to make sure that the spaces are conducive to education we're looking at making sure that the space is set up so that Carver Elementary School, which butts up against Moore Street, Carver Elementary School and Moore Street School, they bump up against each other. I can't remember all of the dates, but then it was like 1886 for Moore Street School. They added on to Moore Street School in 1914. Then they added on to Carver Elementary School, and then they expanded Carver Elementary School. So it's a huge little campus in, in, and of, in and of by itself, but not all of it's being used, obviously, because Moore Street School was not being used in any way, shape, form, or fashion. All right, so where are we now? We're working with RPS and the City of Richmond to acquire the building. We realize that in order to make this happen, we have to do, there's four phases to this project. The phase one is the acquisition of the building. After we, after we acquire the building, then the next phase will be stabilization of the building. After we stabilize the building, we want to restore and preserve the building for another 100 some odd years. Okay, and then utilization. How would the building be used? Okay, we're looking at all kinds of things as far as the uh, utilization is concerned. We want to identify where we are, we're going to identify the steps as far as stabilizing the building, and Nick Cooper with Hanbury uh, Architect is actually working on that as we speak. So he's saying these are phase one, step one, phase two, step so forth and so forth. Our donor base has increased to the point we have raised $194,000, uh, 6, $194,602.35. And the reason why I'm so excited about that, because we started with a, besides what Warren has committed, we, start, we started with a grassroots process. And we talked to some of the big donors, how it was, or some of the big funding companies that asked how to do this. And they said, you're going about this all wrong. And I said, well, tell that to Bernie Sanders. And the reason why I said that, because Bernie Sanders started with the grassroots, give me $3, give me $2, give me a dollar, whatever the case may be. And so that's pretty much what we have been doing. It's like we ask friends and family, give me a dollar here, give me $3 here, whatever you can spare what is what we, what we appreciate. And so with all of that being said, the historic Richmond Foundation said, hmm, we believe in the project, this building is worth saving. And so they gave us a $50,000 matching grant. All right, which was really exciting, and they, it, 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 
it, it, it has conditions, and the conditions are we have a strong board, which we created, okay, uh, that we matched the $50,000, which we did, okay, and then the last thing that we're working on right now is the acquisition of the building. Great. We're on our way to that, all right? We, I talked to Delegate Jeff Bourne, and this is a really interesting process. I talked to Jeff, uh, Delegate Jeff Bourne, and I said to him, I said, I need some help from you. And he said, what do you need? And I said, I need a letter of recommendation for the project, and I need money for the project. He said, how much money do you think you need? And I said, $7 million. He said, I'll give you $75,000. Okay, okay, I'll take that. You know, <laughs> and so it, the interesting thing about it was that we knew that the bill had, was on the docket. All right, and so I called Warren and I said, hey Warren, we have H Bill 30 on the docket. And he said, okay. And so he was writing letters to his representatives and I was writing letters to my representative. And then at the end of General Assembly, they said the bill passed. And I was so excited about the opportunity of having that bill passed because that once again is telling us that there are people out there that believe in the project. Well, also too, I was, we, the Morris Street School was on social media. And we, you know, doing our social media thing and all this type of wonderful stuff and just talking about how great we are and how great we're gonna be and the challenges and the trials and tribulations. And I was kind of like playing it for all it's worth for the most part. It's not really that many trials and tribulations. It's just a matter of getting it done. Well, someone said, have you applied for this grant? And I'm like, I don't know anything about this grant. And she said, you should apply. I'm saying, I don't know anything about it. She says, apply, I'm on the board. We said, okay, so we applied for the grant, and then three months later, we got the grant. And I was like, whoa, and I had to tell everybody in the world, like, well, look, we just got a $100,000 grant. So the nice thing about it is this, is that when we see the dollars come in, what we understand is this, is that we know we need a lot more, but when we see the dollars come in, what we understand is that people believe in the project, even where we stand, without having acquisition of the building. People believe in the project, and so that, is what keeps driving us on and on and on and on and on. I've already talked about the planning of the program for the space. All right, storytelling. We want to tell the story of several things. One, first and foremost, we want to tell the story of Moore Street School. We want to tell the story about Colonel Cutshaw. We want to tell the story about the building itself, the original plans and actions that put the building up. We want to talk about people who have gone to Moore Street School. These are two folks that went to Moore Street School and graduated from that school in the 40s. And we have them on calendar to actually have them tell their story. And they're telling their story from the, uh, from, from the point of segregation, attending Moore Street School. Their stories are pretty powerful. Their stories are, we can make it. Okay, it's not those uh, woe is me kinds of stories. This is who we are, this is what we do, and this is what we're going to do when we reach graduation. We're going to also tell the stories of those that went to Moore Street School during integration, all right? And we want to tell those stories because Moore Street School became one of the premier high schools, it became open high school. And if you know about open high school in the city of Richmond, you know that is one of our star schools for the most part. Well, Moore Street School was open high school, and I just found out about that. And I just had a conversation with a couple of um, open high school graduates that went to Moore Street School, and they said that they'll be more than glad to be part of the um, recording of their experiences at Moore Street School. Let me go back to these two. This is Joseph M. Steeles, and Joseph M. Steeles was one of my advisors while I was at Virginia Union. Uh, he was sort of like a guy that Warren was talking about, that he would kind of tell you what you're going to do in life. You know, you're going to go to med school, you're going to become a mason, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and so forth and so forth. And we absolutely loved him for that, because he helped us chart our course to become who we are. All right, this is Dolores Murray. Dolores Murray was an educator, or was an educator, in Richmond Public Schools, and also, too, she's a jazz singer, which is why we kind of said we don't want to focus on jazz because of and honor of Dolores Murray. And she showed around. So when I say in honor of, living in honor. Oh, and then lastly, we're going to talk about the Carver, element, Carver, Carver Civic Association. I said earlier that Carver, people think of Carver as an African-American community, and it hasn't been that for quite some time. 
And so what we want to do is actually tell the story, collect memorabilia, and we're going to create an archive slash library in the Moore Street School. So therefore, if you want to go back and look up Colonel Cutshaw, people who attended Moore Street School, people who lived in Carver, and that means the, because what's interesting about Carver is that Carver used to be called Sheep Hill, and the Germans lived in Carver. And my house sits on a hill. Well, it doesn't really sit on a hill. They carve, I'm sorry, they carve out Clay Street so that they can run traffic through, all right? And so my house kind of sits on an embankment, or, well, my street does anyway. And so we want to talk about that experience as well. We want to talk about things in Carver, like there was a special grape that was grown in Carver years ago. And so we have somebody in my neighborhood that said, I'm going to find this grape and I'm going to grow this grape again. So those are the kinds of things that we want to have. Those are the kinds of stories that we want to tell. We want to tell everyone's story that has lived in Carver in, in some way, shape, form, or fashion. So we're collecting data, we're collecting memorabilia to actually put in the archives. What was interesting about the, that VCU had a community engagement representative, and the community engagement representative, when he left VCU, he kind of said, I have something for you. And he came to my house with pictures and tubs and this, that, and the other of all this Carver stuff. So, you know, my spare bedroom is now the archives for the Carver Civic Association. Now, let me take you to the Moore Street School as we move to Plan C, all right? What you can't see, and I, I, I should have done a better job, but where it says site, well, you, you can see where the parking lot is on the left of the building. I don't want to hit the wrong button. Well, you see the gray with the white stripes? That, still, that will still belong to Carver Elementary School. The white space to where it says purple and parking, outdoor theater, and uh, that's going to be part of the Moore Street School space that the city is, well, the school board is saying, this is what we're going to surplus to you guys once we really let the building go, all right? And so where you see the art guard and the signage, that's when we were talking about your spatial experience. So when you walk up to the school, the experience of this, the, the experience of entering the building starts when you get out of your car. All right. The outdoor amphitheater is an amphitheater slash classrooms, uh, all kinds of wonderful spaces, if you will. This green, what you see in green which is, we don't have it up there as of yet. Well, not, we, we have it up there, but what you see in green is what Dominion Energy has committed to the project. And I'm really excited about that because we kind of said to Dominion Energy, the Carver Civic Association, if we help you out with this project of moving your substation, then we would like to see this. And they came back a lot stronger. They said, we will actually not only do your side of the street, but we'll do across the street where their property is located as well. So that's pretty exciting to have Dominion Energy on board earlier on in the game. Now, if this is, makes any sense, and this is, um, this, these are new renditions of what we're planning as far as the school is concerned. Carver Elementary has 16 classrooms in it today. Where it says practice school, and what you're looking at is the lower level, okay? As far as the lower level is concerned, what we're doing is that we're expanding the space that says practice space. So we took a classroom and we're gonna um, open it up so that it's a large practice space in the basement. Where it says dark room, there was a dark room in the, in the building already. This, um, stop fighting with that, but where it says dark room, there was a dark room in the building already, so we're going to recommission that dark room. You'd be surprised how many people are walking around with 35 millimeter film right now, and they're actually looking for things to do with that 35 millimeter film, and they're taking wonderful pictures with it. The dance room, we're going to, that was there, we're going to keep that there, but we're turning it to two practice rooms. Of course, there's our mechanical uh, structures there as well, and then there's the restroom. And that's the lower level. Okay, that's the lower level that you're looking at. All right, this first floor, what we're looking at doing as far as the first floor is concerned is where the, right here, that's gonna drop off. We're taking that off, all right? And I'll get back to that in a moment. But this is gonna be the new entryway. So when you come in on the lower level, you're in the new entryway. You'll take an elevator up to the first floor, which is what we're looking at now. 
This is going to be an open lounge. These stairs are all already there. They're going to remain, okay? The storage room is obviously what we're going to just store junk in. But we're adding more steps to the building to take you upstairs and downstairs. This cafe library, this is the archive that we were talking about. And this cafe just sits in the middle of the floor for the most part, but it's just pretty much a hangout space. We're adding a rehearsal room, two rehearsal rooms for whomever want to use it. Then they can also be flex spaces to be used as classrooms. Here's the event space, and the event space is designed for the practitioners or the practitioners of music in the building when they want to do recitals or if you want to do a wedding, whatever the case may be, if you want to do a holiday party, then it can be used in that event space. Okay, and this is the second floor, the final floor. Once again, we have another rehearsal space, and what we did, the, where we separated it on a, in the ground level, we're separating on the first floor and the second floor as well. We have two rehearsal halls, again, or two rehearsal spaces, or flex spaces. Then we have the offices for whomever back there. And then there's gonna be a little tiny, obviously small practice room. And then this is another music lounge that sits up with sort of almost like an atrium. Okay, so. How can I help? And I hope you're asking that question. There's a couple of things you can do. You can visit our website, and the website is up there, www.morestreet.org. Okay, the foundation would appreciate if you would send a letter of support for the project, either by email, or you can mail it to our address, which is PO Box 25305, Richmond, Virginia, 23260. And if you want to, if you are an Amazon user and you use Amazon Smile, then you can make us our, your charity of choice. And by all means, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions, concerns, suggestions. I'm open to all of that. We're still trying to figure out what we're doing and how to make it work. And so pretty much, I want to thank you. All right, let me just, before we do that, this is the new version of the Moore Street School. As you can see, the windows in blue, we're keeping the same format for the windows, but we're lowering them down. And so where you can see, I'm gonna try this again, right here, this is where the steps were. Now it's a street level entry, so it makes it easier for folks to get into the building. You'll be entering in on the lower level, and you're gonna to go to the mezzanine and or the second floor. And I am open for questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, ideas. Well, I was just wondering with the jazz emphasis, are you working with VCU? Because that's such a famous jazz school. We'll be working with VCU for the most part, but more than likely what we're going to do is start, we're going to, we're going to move towards VCU, the Richmond Jazz Society, but what we're going to start with will be the high schools because once these kids graduate from high school for the most part, if they want to continue on and be in some sort of jazz ensemble, we want to give them that outlet. So we're going to start with like middle school, high school, the, I like to say that the goal for the participation in any of the programs at Moore Street School will be from K through 99, all right? Uh, what's, what's interesting, I didn't mention this, but for those of you who are gospel enthusiasts, Hezekiah Walker, who is an international re gospel recording star, he has also signed on to the project as, this, as a supporter for the most part. And so he said to me when we went to have conversations about this project, he said whatever he can help with, he will be more than glad to help out with. I saw that one of the first steps you need to do is to acquire the building from the city. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, thinking that the city will just you deed it over to you at no cost, or you have to pay for it? Really? Well, there's two options here. One, they could deed it over to us to get it off their hands. But we're also prepared to actually purchase the building from the city. Uh, and so we're, th those are, that's information that we're working out now as far as what our second proposal will look like. We've submitted proposal number one to the city, and pro proposal number one was to why don't you pretty much lease the building to us for a short term, to use the building as a fundraising effort. And they kind of said no, but what's interesting about all of that is that we go in the building anyway all the time because we ask them 
well, can we take a tour of the building? And they're like, yeah. And so we take a tour. Of, when we take a tour of the building, we bring people in there. So we're think. Uh, let me back up too. All right. Here's what we feel really optimistic about. My city council representative set up a meeting with the um, assistant CAO, chief operating, chief administrative officer for the building, and with the school board. So it was the foundation, the city of Richmond, and the school board. And the school board was kind of dragging their feet as far as the meeting was concerned. And the chief operating officer said, look, this building has been sitting around too long. Let's do something with it. And so she assigned to us someone out of her office to be our liaison. She sent us an amazing liaison. You know, we, we, we talk to him all the time. He tells us exactly where we are, exactly what can and cannot happen. I just recently had a conversation with um, the director of economic development with the city. And so I kind of told him what the school board is, where the school board is. And he said, I don't understand that. And so what's happening is that we're trying to figure out what's the holdup with the school board to release the building. We're thinking that for the most part, the city is going to do is going to give us a pretty good deal as far as the building is concerned because we've made enough noise in communities. We made enough noise to let them know that. The, and, and with that being said, they see that we're raising money for this project, so they're I, we're thinking that we're going to get the building from the city. We don't think that we're going to. We th we just have to convince the school board to do the quick claim deed. And so I will be at school board in the next two weeks to talk about this for the third time, why you should release this building with through a quick a quick claim deed. Did I answer your question? No. Thank you. There's one more person. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if this is a couple of steps too far into the plan, but I was curious if you had a plan for um, when this is eventually finished, the faculty and staff and stuff, is it going to be on like a volunteer type of basis or is it going to be like a staffed type of thing? It's, it's, we're planning on it being staffed. We're planning on actually paying folks. To, well, there will be some volunteers in there, obviously, but we're actually looking at staffing in the process with uh, Professional, professionally trained instructors for the most part, uh, an, an executive director that's going to be paid staff. We want to keep uh, institutional director in, in, engaged as well. So therefore, when you look at um, performing art organizations, they pretty much have those things in place. Now, we know that we're not going to be able to compete with the Richmond Symphony as far as participants. And when I say participants, the size of the orchestra in and of itself, but a small jazz ensemble we feel as though that we could actually house and home that jazz ensemble and keep them funded. Thank you for a great talk. Oh, thank, and, you, uh, thank you, thank uh, you. Uh, hope you all enjoyed it. I think it's a, an amazing uh, project that it's his passion. I mean, he's, uh, he's so passionate about this, and I am too. I think it's <laughs> gonna be a, a, a wonderful addition to downtown Richmond. And so, thank you again, Jerome, for yeah. coming out and presenting this to us. And uh, uh, I'm sure we all support it. Thank you, thank you. And like I said, you have my phone number, email, call me, let me know what you think when you kind of like wake up in the middle of the night, like, uh, what did you think? All, all, all funds accepted. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.